It's a heart behind bars. And this signifies the fact that the people we love are incarcerated and we're doing our time with them. And I say, and I've said since my husband was arrested, that I was doing my time on the outside. The United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world, with 2.3 million people currently serving time. The media gives a distorted view of prison life, filled with violence, power struggles, and scandalous relationships. But we forget about the families the incarcerated leave behind. There are 120,000 mothers and 1.1 million fathers behind bars in the U.S. 2.7 million children have a parent in prison. 105,000 of them in New York. Each of these families endure their own struggles as they live with their hearts behind bars. So what I used to do after a visit, I put my children in a double stroller and one of my colleagues, uh, my teacher, teacher friends, um, would come with me and we would walk the children back and forth in front of uh, the jail. And he would be able to look out. Usually one of the guards would allow him to look out onto the street so at least he could see the girls, though they could not see him. My husband was a very kind, generous man, except when he was drinking. He had a mental illness which he masked with alcohol. And when he drank, he became violent. So my husband can be described as a, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There were two sides of him. One side um, I loved dearly, the other side I feared. Barbara's husband, Gene Allen, returned home one night with his father after a night of drinking. The two began an argument that turned deadly when Gene grabbed the shotgun from the hall closet and killed his father. He called me one evening and told me that he had just shot and killed his father in my kitchen. Uh, of course, I didn't believe him. He was very manipulative, and I knew that he wanted me to come back home. And I assumed that this was his way of getting me there, of pushing my buttons, kind of. But he did put the phone down to his father's mouth, and I could hear the gurgling, the, the death rattle. Barbara's husband was convicted of murder. After a plea deal, he was sentenced to two and a half to seven years in prison. But she says it wasn't his crime that changed her life. It was his imprisonment. Um, there was um, not, not a, a bit of my life that remained the same except my job. Very fortunately, I was a school teacher. I had a career as most women who are brought into this, they don't, but I was fortunate and I had two very supportive parents. So I was able to, uh, to maintain um, some kind of a semblance of life at this point. Um, but uh, my life revolved around trying to get him help. Barbara made sure she and her daughters visited her husband as much as possible. Prison visitations are not as colorful or as lenient as it appears on screen. So I said through a telephone and the screen, I had to stand on my tiptoe, and there were people surrounding us. There was never any privacy, and we were sure, and it's probably true, that we were being recorded. And so you're afraid of what you say. Gene spent a year in the Nassau County Jail waiting his deposition. I, um, they were not allowed to visit at the jail. In those days, there were no visiting for children under 16. No telephone contact. This goes back to 1966. So um, the children lost total contact with their father. Now, um, Gene was a good father most of the time. You know, as long as uh, he was drinking, and when he was drinking, I really did protect my children from him. So their their remembrance of him was as a, as a good good person in their life, and now they had absolutely no contact with him. One evening, during the first year of Jean's imprisonment, Barbara was watching an episode of the David Susskind show and was first introduced to something that would give her hope, the Fortune Society. The Fortune Society is a 48-year-old organization dedicated to aiding former incarcerated persons in becoming positive, contributing members in society. The founder of this organization is former theater producer David Rothenberg. While working on the play Fortune Men's Eyes, 
Rothenberg took a trip to Rikers Island that drastically changed his career focus. I saw a lot of young men being herded about. That's, it looked like a cattle call. And my instinct said, and I said it aloud uh, frequently right after that, if these young men, and that's what we were, we were in the juvenile women's shelter, if these young men were there because they broke the law, they did something wrong, they had an addiction, whatever the reasons were that, that put them there, how are they going to be better as a result of this experience? Not too long after watching the David Susskind show, Barbara reached out to Rothenberg and the Fortune Society. I received hundreds and hundreds of letters, and one of them was from a woman in Long Island who said, I'm doing my time on the outside. My husband, Gene Allen, was incarcerated, and I, Barbara Allen, said, she said in the letter that she has two little girls, and she feels all alone. And I called, it was a whole... You know, you get lots and lots of mails, but this one cried for a response immediately. Rothenberg called Barbara and arranged to meet her the next day on Long Island. And from then, he referred families of the incarcerated to Allen. So that was really part of one area of how I started working with families. And then when I went to uh, the visiting rooms to visit, I reached out to the families in the visiting areas for me because I felt so alone. I felt as if there was no one I could really talk to who would understand what I'm feeling and what I'm going through, except the woman standing next to me in the visiting room. Barbara had met two women who wanted to start a support group for families of the incarcerated. The two met at Barbara's house one night and Prison Families Anonymous began. So I did it selfishly. I did it because I did not want to be alone. And I thought if I felt that way, I'm sure everybody else out there did. And I didn't want anyone to have to go through that by themselves. Jean was sent to Sing Sing, the correctional facility that had prison reception. So there they had contact visits. You could uh, bring the children and the children could sit on his lap and there was just a table separating us. Sing Sing is up a hill and you, you brought a pack, package. You're allowed 35 pound package a month. And um, you had to drag it up the hill and, and the children and God help you. If you veered from the path, you'd hear booming voice from the uh, guard tower yelling at you. Once his reception period was over, Alan's husband was transferred to Greenhaven Correctional Facility. There, the visitation conditions were very different. The only contact you could have with him is fingertip contact. Alan compared her husband's housing at Greenhaven to that of an animal. I did not want my children to see their father in a cage because literally that's what it was. He was in a, in a cage. So the business with the children stopped at that point. In the spring of Jean's imprisonment, Greenhaven began an annual family day picnic in the prison yard. The inmates cooked and Alan says for a day they could almost feel normal again. Oh, it was wonderful. We were together like a family, and he could hug his daughters. And uh, I guess it was a lot of trepidation. You know, when I uh, came home from visits, when I left the prison, um, I always carpooled going up because I met all these families. And uh, going up, we all be very um, animated and talk about... Um, Oh, when we stopped on the way at the diner or something, they only knew who we were, you know? Yeah. They only knew where we were going. <laughs> but coming home, you could hear a pin drop. The ride was so silent. And I guess that's what kept me going with those two girls. What did we want to do? Alan eventually had to discuss her husband's imprisonment with her young daughters. Very proud. I explained to my children as they were getting a little bit older that... Um, Daddy did something wrong. He made a terrible mistake, and he needs to be punished. Like when you make a mistake and, and you do something wrong, Mommy gives you time out. Well, that's what's happening to Daddy. Something, um, but I kept telling him the whole time that he loved them and he misses them. And uh, there was no um, communication other than writing. So he wrote letters from the county jail, and I would read him them portions of the letters because his letters were filled with how much he loved his children and how much better life was going to be, which was not true. But at the time, I know he meant it, and I really tried to believe it. Over the years, Barbara has participated in speaking engagements, phone support, facilitating Prison Families Anonymous support meetings, and advocacy. 
Allen also works with a writing program for youths with incarcerated family members and advocates to keep teenagers from entering the adult prison system. Barbara Allen and Prison Families Anonymous have been recognized across Long Island, including being awarded the Martin Luther King Leadership Award. Prison Families Anonymous currently has two chapters on Long Island where they carry out their mission. To help people navigate the system, for them to have a voice and a place to, um, to vent what they're going through to people who understand if they want to cry, they can cry, if they want to scream, if they want to curse, I try to avoid that, but some of them do. But um, navigating the system is an important part, but also advocacy. I think we have a, v a vested interest in what's happening in the criminal justice system. And if we don't care, who will? My busiest day will probably be Tuesday. On Tuesday, I wake up and I would brush my teeth, wash my face, and come down stairs after I get dressed. And then I would take my dog out into the backyard so she could poop and eat and do whatever a dog does. And then I would have some breakfast. Breakfast, I'm usually it's usually about seven thirty-five or so. Call my dad downstairs for him to take me to school. And then I go through the school day, all my regular classes. I have some input in Richard's schedule in that I know what happens in school and I know what's happening in the evenings so, so I can sort of organize his evening with him if he asks. As a parent, sometimes I would say, Richard, do you have um, an assignment on the computer today or do you have a book report? Things like that. And I say, you know, do you have it together? Um, could we, you know, like plan how much time you're going to spend on each thing? Four o'clock, I will call my dad to pick me up and we'll go back home. I'll eat, get dressed for soccer, and leave at about five o'clock to get to soccer practice at Hofstra University at about 5 30. Usually late though. After soccer, I come home, it's about 7.30 when I come home, so I would feed my dog, I would eat something, um, and then I would do my homework. I get a lot of homework sometimes, and then on top of that projects, computer assignments, so that usually takes a long time, so by the time I start my homework, which is at 8.30, and then by the time I finish, which is about maybe 9.30 or later, I would take a shower, brush my teeth, get dressed for bed, and go to bed. Too much pressure is like when my dad, he said he will bother me about, hmm, it's hard to say, bother me about how my grades have to be up if I want to do good in school, and he says that I have to get onto the high honor roll and the principal's list. I have to be on the principal's list at least once this year. And high honor roll, if I get, if I don't get onto the at least the honor roll, he take away my phone. He said, so that's a lot of pressure to keep my grades up. And my soccer, well, my soccer, I usually do good in my soccer. I never chill on it. I never complain about that. So. So well, I don't usually complain about doing good. Well, 
sometimes I feel that when I see him stressed. But I guess in today's world, when you compare it to the other children in school, maybe that's what everybody is doing. So I'm not sure if it's too much or not. You know, if you look at it as an individual thing, and again, I have to look at what I was accustomed to as a child. Well, I don't want to go into my 12 year schedule, but I, I um, you know, I didn't have a television to, to watch and relax. I had to, I had to, um, to walk an hour to and from school <laughs> in, in, in the hot sun. Um, you know, when you get home, you have to um, uh, maybe do activities to get water into the house and uh, and to get food on the table. But um, you know, my 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 schedule was was probably tougher than his because he has me to help him out. I take him to soccer practice. All he has to do is jump in the car. In my case, I had to find my way there. <laughs> All right, so um, you know he's he he has work to do. He has a schedule, but I don't think he's over schedule. I feel that growing up as a child and growing up as a child in Trinidad, life was different. You know, weekends were different. There was a day that was just downtime where you relaxed at home. You did things with your family. I feel like your mind, body, and soul rested. But I feel that doesn't occur with Richard now. And maybe it doesn't occur with most of his peers. So it's hard to always say, you know, it's too much as opposed to it's just enough. I'm very tired during the day. I get pounding headaches in the back of my head. It hurts like really bad. Uh, so yeah, I get pounding headaches and extremely tired sometimes. Every day um, towards the end of school, Every day when I come home from school, my headache is terrible. Like when I go to soccer practice, during the car ride, it's very terrible. I had to go to the hospital for it once. They said this has something to do with my over overloaded schedule. I don't put too much pressure on him. I think I put just enough. Oh no, I definitely don't put pressure on Richard. He puts enough on himself. Too much pressure on myself. Um, people tell me that a lot sometimes, but you know, it gives me good grades. And it makes me better at soccer, so it just makes me really tired. In America, kids have lots of opportunities, way more opportunities than 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 I have had. Um, you know, I, I I was raised in um, circumstances where most kids in my circumstance uh, wouldn't achieve what I have achieved in becoming an attorney. And so I always tell you guys, look, if I can become an attorney in the United States, then, you know, that should be the baseline for you guys. You got to do, do better than that. And there's no excuse for you not to be successful. And I think if you guys, plus you guys have been raised with, uh, with two loving parents, I didn't have that. So you have that advantage. So, um, uh, yeah, I think being raised here, being raised by us as parents, uh, I think you, you all had a great opportunity um, to be successful in this society with the freedom we have here, um, with the opportunities we have here. Um, the sky's the limit. And that's what I want for you guys, just to do the right thing push forward and you know continue to be positive and um, you'll be successful. I'm gonna become a professional soccer player when I'm older. Uh, I'm also gonna go to college. What is a stereotype? It is a widely held but fixed oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. Racial stereotypes. 
We've all heard of them, seen them on the screen, maybe even judged someone based on them. Look at them. They're so ghetto. But where do these stereotypes come from? Who determines which ethnic group possesses which trait? To answer this, we have to go back to the beginning. In American society, there is a social hierarchy of power where white people are on the top and all deemed non-whites at the bottom. In creating this racially oppressive society, prejudice towards non-whites was established and largely enforced. The key element in establishing prejudice within a society is to have the marginalized groups viewed not only as something strange and different from yours, but as dehumanized as possible. When motion pictures and animations became popular, broadcasting racist dehumanizing ideologies and stereotypes became limitless. In the media, black people historically have been characterized in many stereotypes, varying from the coon, the sambo, the mendingo, the savage, the pickaninny, the sapphire, the jezebel, the mammy, and the uncle. The coon was meant to mock a black person's attempt to assimilate into white American culture. This character was often seen as blackface, most common in minstrel shows, where the sambo depicted black men as lazy and content with their minimal standards of living. Black people were also seen as savage and primitive. D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, showcases the mandingo, black men who are primitive, uncontrollable, and violent. Pickaninnies were black children being depicted as savage, dirty, and oftentimes in danger. This creates a lack of empathy towards the image of black children being put in danger, as though they are beings who are content with filth and are immune to violence. The Jezebel possessed sex appeal and lacked value. She was promiscuous with a high sex drive that gave the impression that black women could not be victims of rape. The Sapphire is a black woman who possesses all characteristics that are unladylike. She is domineering, masculine, and lacks maternal instinct. But the only way a black person can be seen as non-problematic to society was if they were either the mammy or an uncle. The mammy was often seen in the roles of maids or house slaves. She was older, had dark skin, was heavy set, and humble. This was an image that posed as non-threatening, for she lacked sex appeal and appeared happy and content, living to serve white people. The uncle Coined from the book title, Uncle Tom's Cabin, by Harriet Breacher Stowe, the uncle is considered the good Negro, who obeys the white men willingly and happily. Many of these same stereotypes are seen in the media today, just under a different name, the Sambo, oftentimes seen now as the unintelligent black person. The Mandingo, seen today as the black athlete. The Sapphire, otherwise known as the angry black woman. Uncle is oftentimes seen as the magical Negro. With each passing decade, black people have made and continue to make significant progress and contributions to society. Yet, these media stereotypes just can't seem to disappear. The third Friday of October was one of the most highly anticipated nights of the purchase community. It was the Neon Lights Party, thrown by Latinos Unidos. Latinos Unidos is one of the cultural clubs on campus. Its objective is to promote diversity on behalf of the Latin community on and off campus. But you do not have to be Latino to be a part of the club. The unique ethnic background of LU's current president is proof in itself. President Stephanie Banja is of Italian, Lebanese, and Turkish descent. She makes history as becoming the first non-Latina president of the club. So what drew you to be actively involved in a club so dedicated to a culture that's not your own? So I guess it would be two reasons. I originally was dragged <laughs> by one of my friends freshman year and I was just like, but I'm not Latina, what am I doing here? Like there's no point. But when I did get there, I did notice that there were a lot of other people who also were not Latina. So I was like, okay, this, this could work. But it was fun. I enjoyed it. I remember that meeting very clearly. We did like skits and everything. And it actually did have to do with different groups of people. So it was kind of funny to like see everyone enacting those. But I guess from there, I kind of just was like, all right, I do like it here. 
the people are really accepting and really nice. So I kept going, and then sophomore year, I became involved. You said there were two reasons. Was oh, yeah, and the other reason, sorry, my stepmom's Dominican, so it's like I kind of feel, even though I'm not Dominican, I'm, I was raised with part of that culture in me because they her and my dad have been together since I was like five, so I've grown up with that side of her family as well. And I've been to DR a couple times and like not just on resorts, so it's like I do know the culture a little bit. Despite the judgment Bonja faces for not being Latina, she uses her unique background to promote intracultural curiosity and involvement. So how do you further embrace the Latina culture beyond halfway growing up with it? Um, I do know how to cook Dominican food, so I guess that could count. I dance, so I know bachata, merengue, um, my salsa is, we're working on it. It's not bad, it's been a work in progress. With neon lights, all eyes were on Banja as she stepped up to the plate to produce this party. I'm pretty much now learning that I have to let my reins loose a little bit and be more on the supervising end instead of doing everything myself. So I'm, I like, I'm pretty much just making sure that all the supplies have been ordered, all the docs have been updated, um, emails have been sent out, flyers have been printed out, promotions still going. It's just mainly overseeing now because I remember since my responsibilities the past two years have been more on that other end where I'm doing the nitty gritty work. Now it's just like I have to make sure that the nitty gritty work is getting done by everybody else. When the big day finally came, Banja had to put her nerves aside and just hope that the countless hours she and her club have spent working toward the party pay off. What are your overall expectations for the night? For neon lights? Ooh, just that everything runs smoothly because that's always the most difficult part. The day of where I, just, I don't have to worry as much even though we all know I'm going to worry. But I just want everything to run smoothly from beginning to end. Clean up the breeze. Nobody's destroying anything that shouldn't that should be respected because that's happened in previous years. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And I just because I know usually for that event it's a very large event, so I'm just hoping that no fights break out or anything like that, and that everyone can just get along and have a great time and just enjoy themselves. Throughout the night, people seemed to be enjoying themselves, and the party was surely making an impression on new purchase students. In honor of it being the first LU party of the semester, former LU presidents and purchase alumni made a special appearance. This is my president from last year, and this is the president from the year before that. It goes a lot much better now that the turnout's good. Everyone seems to be having fun. The decorations pulled through after we had a huge... I'll be, I'll be nice and eloquent. Bull crap thing happened with the PSTA yesterday, but we're good, so we're happy. Dave, what do you want? It's three o'clock in the morning, and why do all black people gotta make a beat when they knock on the door? Look, Lindsay, I'm nervous about the promo. Can we talk, please? Can, can we? Whoa! Can we talk? So you said you needed help with the promo. Yeah, so I'm very distraught. See, I don't know what to say. Should I be like, hey, ladies? <laughs> Wait, before you like... continue, can you answer me this one question? What? Why do you have pantyhose on your head? They're not pantyhose! I'm tired of saying pantyhose! Not pantyhose! No, do rag! Better? No, I'll just leave that little thought to myself. This is serious, all right? So, Look. so anyway, yeah, you have a... All right, I don't know how should I say it, because I'm trying to get some bitches after the show, like, boom, boom. Should I be like, hey, I'm Dave Lexton. Or like, hey, How about Dave you just Lexton. show me what you have? <laughs> oh, you little freaking tonight, huh? <laughs> show me what you got. <laughs> Why was that in your shirt? 
Cause I don't have pockets. See what happened was I tricked. Yes, you do. You got pockets right there. Look, don't don't work on my watch. Come on. So how about we say it kind of something like this? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Lindsay Wilson. And I'm Dave Langston. And we're hosting a show called TWO, Think Wide Open. So if you want to be a part of the show or think you have some sort of talent, you could submit and you could contact one of us via email. So you can get me at lindsay.wilson at purchase.edu and him at... Don't hit me up because I got things to do. You know, I got ladies calling me. I got people doing things that say, hey, Dave, what's up? I'm trying to go to... Ow! 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 So uh, that Maybelline you used to something, cause uh, you always. Know,